Ephesians chapter 1 is where we are. You know, we began the book of Ephesians last week, and um, I don't want to go very far today. I can see several, well, several families not here, and I don't want to leave them behind. We're going to cover a little bit of this. We're going to review and just kind of lightly look at the things that God will say to us where we are in Ephesians. One of the things, if you turn there, I want to read where we were last week, and then we'll press forward starting in verse 3. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 is where we are. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And if you are not familiar with Calvary Chapel in any way, uh, one of our distinctives is that any time that we're together uh, in a corporate gathering, we are traveling through the Word. Amen? Amen. And through the Bible, uh, you know, one book at a time, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And so, and by the way, those of you who are hearing me by translation, good morning to you as well. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, notice it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the beloved. I love that. So, Father, we do thank you, Lord God. We pray even now as we turn to your scripture that your word would do exactly what it is meant to do on the inside of us, Lord God, to wash us, to strengthen us, to build our faith, to rebuke us, to correct us, to comfort us. Lord, all of the things that are necessary. And I pray that you would allow us, even at this very moment, to open our hearts to what you have to say. And for those who are having a hard time doing that, Lord, move upon them now. Remove the cares of this life and the concerns for the stuff back home away from their hearts and their minds, and even the distraction from this room. Lord, speak to us about our eternal blessings, Lord, the things that you have in the place that you've called us to be true citizens, our heavenly kingdom, Lord. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, for the sake of review, last week we kind of got stuck in verse 3. We, we made our way down to at least verse 5, but we kind of got stuck in verse 3. And I want to take you back there because remember what Paul was doing in verse 3 when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word in the Greek is the word that we get the, the English word eulogize from, is, which is what we do at funerals. Remember I shared that with you last week. At funerals we eulogize the person who's deceased, meaning that we praise them or we speak good of them, which I told you sometimes is not easy because um, there are some scoundrels out there that I've had to do funerals for, and um, all I was able to do was give a gospel message because it wasn't no, nothing good to say. <laughs> and I ain't lying at a funeral. Um, but here, Paul does it. Peter does it in 1 Peter. We see it throughout the New Testament. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a spontaneous praise of God for who He is and what He's done, which is what we had to do this morning in wake of what could have happened here, but what did happen in other places. But we can still, as the body of Christ, always bring Him praise. Amen? Amen. Because no matter what we face, we have to, as the people of God, we have to kind of sometimes stand outside of the things we see and realize the God that we serve and the God that has laid up so many things for us. Remember, the Bible says that we are sojourning. Y'all remember I tell you that often? We are moving through this life, through this world. This place, this world is not our home. The possessions we have, we will not take with us. Naked we came in and naked we'll leave. And so, and Peter tells us that everything that we currently have on this earth, all of the earth and the elements thereof will burn with a fervent heat, and the Lord will do it over. Amen? Amen. That's good. That means all the stuff you're worried about is going to burn anyway. And when we get on the other side, none of it's going to matter. And we have to keep that in mind as we begin to approach this. It's a spontaneous praise to God for everything that He is. And remember what we talked about last week. Specifically, Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what we said, who blessed us. Notice with every spiritual blessing, we talked about it last week, spiritual blessings, not earthly blessings. Not the things that we have here, although they're good. Amen? And He blesses us. He has blessed us so abundantly. I mean, how many people are in this room today and safe and, and, you know, and a little inconvenience of power outages is no big deal. When we're in missions in Africa, that was like our every hour on the hour thing in Nigeria. <laughs> you know, power's going out at some point during the day. Um, we're so blessed here in America. The church is so blessed. But he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing we talked about this last week. 
you got to look at the language very carefully when you read the Bible because everything that the Holy Spirit put there is put there to bless you and to teach you something. And if you look at the verse again, notice it says every spiritual blessing. I'm stuck there again, y'all. I can't get past it. That means every possible spiritual blessing that there is, he's given those things to us. Notice where they reside, in the heavenlies, not on earth. That's good. That means that these blessings are secure. You know, because in, in wake of a storm that come through, one thing we know is that the earthly blessings ain't always secure. You know, you go home and stuff done floated away and stuff has been messed up sometimes and, and those things happen. But these spiritual blessings are in heavenly places, meaning that they are eternally yours from God. And, and Peter says over First Peter that they can't be corrupted or tainted. Moth can't come in and corrupt them. They can't be stolen. They cannot be taken from you. Jesus even says that those whom the Father has given me, no one can pluck any of them from my hand. So your salvation is secure and the spiritual blessings that you have are secure because notice they're not just in the heavenlies. And notice again where it says here, in Christ. And I love that because in the Greek, it's a primary preposition denoting a position. Throughout the New Testament, this phrase, in Christ, of which we see several times in this chapter, it keeps coming up. In Christ, we are seated with him. We are in Christ, seated in heavenly places. You've read that before, right? How many of you would say that I am in Christ? Raise your hand if you would say I am in Christ. That means that spiritually your position, your reality is that you are positioned in Christ. And if you're positioned in Christ, then that means that, that your life takes on a different form. We, we've talked about this. You are a son or daughter of God, the God of all the universe through Jesus Christ. And so he looks at you and sees you positioned in Christ. That means you have eternal life. And not only eternal life, as we're going to learn later on down here, the sealing of the Holy Spirit on your life, it marks you as belonging to the Father. So we are in Christ. And because we're in Christ, then that means that what is Christ is also ours. And where he is is where we belong. And what he has inherited, we have inherited with him. We're going to talk about all of that. And that's amazing. And some, sometimes people don't like verses like this because it doesn't talk a lot about the natural and the here and the now and the material world. And I think what God wants us to understand is it's so much greater than that. How we just went through a storm and then y'all come and praise with amazing joy because there's a spiritual blessing. Number one, the fruits of the Spirit, which we looked at back in Galatians, are evident in your life every time we come together in fellowship. The joy of the Lord, which strengthens you. The peace that passes all understanding, which guard, guards your heart. The fact that the Word of God is now alive inside of you. You understand it. You feast upon it, and it grows you. And that's something that didn't happen before we were in Christ. Because before I was in Christ, I didn't get it. It wasn't doing anything for me as it does now every time I open it up. Even like but spiritual blessings, the things that we hold on to, that in the midst of whatever we as believers go through, we understand that God always has a greater purpose for the all of it. And I think the thing is that we have to remember not to be distracted by life, but to pursue God with all our heart. Our spiritual blessings are in heavenly places in Christ, and you can't lose them. And what he's trying to call you to do is to uh, approach him daily. Your walk with the Lord needs to be daily. And takes things like this sometimes to get us to, to focus on him, unfortunately. But it'll have its work in our lives. So spiritual blessings, we looked at it last week. We also looked at the fact that he chose us, verse 4, remember that. Also in Christ, see that again, in him he chose us. He did that before the foundation of the world. Remember, we talked about that. But so before everything was done, before he even began to form this world, before the foundation of the world, he had already chosen us in Christ that we would be holy, notice, without blame before him in love, which is a miracle work that we will stand before a holy God one day, those of us who know Christ, and we will stand there. And he'll see us as sons and daughters, and he can look upon us. We'll see him face to face, and we won't be consumed. That's a big deal. Remember, he told Moses, no one can see me face to face and live. But we will see him face to face because we are his sons and his daughters. The Bible says that when we see him, we will see him because we'll be like him, John tells us. So he chose us before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, having predestined us or predetermined something. And what was it that he would have, that he would adopt us, notice in verse 5, as sons by Jesus Christ to himself 
according to the good pleasure of his will. So those of us who belong to him, we have been adopted, chosen, adopted. We're going to see accepted in a minute, meaning that God has adopted you as a son or daughter by the work. Listen, by the work that was done by Jesus Christ. Amen. We understand that not by our own favor or anything we've done. We'll learn that in chapter two, that it's not by anything we've done. No one can boast. It's only by what the Lord has done. And notice it's to the good pleasure of his will. It's because he wanted to. I like that part. He did it because he wanted to, because he loved us. Notice to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us, notice, accepted in the beloved. Meaning that he, God the Father, made us accepted in the beloved, which is Jesus Christ. So we have been accepted in Christ, which is where we are positioned. That's good news. Satan is going to be cast into the lake of fire along with the Antichrist and, and the false prophet. We know that. Amen. And all that they lead astray. And on judgment day, when everybody is gathered and all of that is brought before the great right throne, we are hidden in Christ. We will not face judgment because we are hidden in Christ. And notice beautiful words. We need to understand that. Listen, one of the things I'll say as I end this part of the review, that God's choosing of us is, is based on, it's not based on the decision to save some, listen, and not others. Because if you think that way, you limit his love and also remove his sovereignty. Or listen, if you believe that his choosing has nothing to do with man, having free will would actually take away our responsibility. And sometimes it's hard for us to fathom it all. And just because you can't intellectually get your mind around all of that that we just read last week and just reviewed, doesn't mean it's not true. And one of the things we have to learn to do is take God's word at face value. So then before he began all this work, he could predestine you according to foreknowledge, the Bible says over in Romans chapter 8, according to foreknowledge, God standing outside of time and seeing the whole thing from start to finish, understanding those of us who would come using the free will that he would give us to accept his gospel message. So therefore, knowing that and having that foreknowledge, he predestined us and went ahead with the whole plan. We talked about that last week, didn't we? And that is a blessing. And that's what our God has done for us. He's the initiator. Verse 7, as we continue our study then. Notice what it says next. In him, again, I love this. In him, in Christ, we have redemption. And I love this because, listen, redemption means a releasing affected by payment of ransom. You get that? Meaning that we have been released because of a payment of ransom. What, what on earth is going on? What were we released from? Well, we were released from being slaves to sin and headed to hell. And there was no, we were sold into slavery, if you will, when Adam sinned. We were born in sin and iniquity. And then on top of that, we sinned. We've lived a life in past times of sin. And it says we have redemption or we have this releasing from slavery by payment of ransom, meaning that because Jesus paid the cost of our sin, we have been released, those of us who believe. Now, the Bible gives us this picture all the way through. You can find it consistently woven through the scriptures of the Old Testament that in order for someone to be redeemed, there was this process that God put in motion so we could get the picture clear in our hearts and minds that there must be a kindred redeemer in order for that to happen. Y'all have heard me talk about it many times. In other words, if somebody went into slavery... Because they, they were in debt, they, they had made some mistakes, they were in slavery, they were many different types of slaves, um, their own, and they lost their property, everything was taken from them. The only way that this could be rectified is there was a process of redemption, because God did not want his people to be perpetually in debt and have slavery within the land. So God made it possible that every seven years would be a year of release and people would go free from their debts. But if a redeemer came, listen, a redeemer could come and buy back the property and redeem it for the family. You follow me? And redeem the person. It had to be someone who was kin in order for it to happen. The picture is very clear that Jesus was kindred redeemer to us because, listen, because man sinned, the Bible says, and through man came death and slavery to sin, then also through a man had to come freedom and payment. The one who would pay for sin also had to be a man in order for it to be a kindred redeemer. The problem is, in order for one to pay for sin, 
He had to be perfect and without sin, without spot and without blemish. The problem that comes from that is the Bible says that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. That's what Scripture, y'all know that, amen? Which means, listen, which means the problem that man has is man is sold into slavery and we could get bought out by a kindred redeemer, but there's no one who can qualify because all of us are rotten. So none of us can pay for ourselves. We're all sinners. So therefore, this redemption becomes a huge deal because the only way we can be redeemed is if there be a perfect man. And from Adam, because Adam being the first man who sinned, all men coming from Adam are born in sin. So there's no way possible for any man to ever qualify to redeem us from sin. We are lost eternally. And so the miracle that had to happen, the incarnation we call it, is that God himself would have to take upon himself human flesh and become a man. And that is what happened as the Spirit of God moved upon Mary. Y'all know the story. And she conceived and brought forth her firstborn son. His father was Father God in heaven. Joseph was his stepfather. Y'all know the scriptures. So God became a man and dwelt among us, the Bible tells us in the Gospel of John. And he lived the perfect life. And that perfect life that was without sin, and you got to remember, on the day, so, so many people believe that somehow Jesus became the Christ at his baptism when the Spirit of God descended and said, this is my you know, son in whom I'm well pleased and all that. Y'all remember that, right? But what the, what the voice of God said is, this is my son in whom I am pleased, meaning I'm already pleasing him, meaning from the point he was born, even up to that point, Jesus was without sin, perfect in every way. And so he becomes a kindred redeemer because he became a man. But he be qualifies to be a redeemer because he's God and without sin. So then, therefore, God himself came down to become the redeemer because we were lost and we couldn't get back to him. This is the magnitude of his love. So when we go back and say that, listen, he chose us before the foundation of the world. He predestined us. He, in eternity's past, looked at the whole scene and understood fully Father, Son, and Spirit understood fully the process of redemption would require one of them, the Son, to come and die a painful death to pay for sin. And that is exactly what Jesus did. Now, notice what it says next, verse 7. In him we have redemption. In him we have been purchased out of our slavery and freed. But notice it's through his what, y'all? His blood. I love that. Through his blood. This becomes a beautiful thing to begin to contemplate through his blood. And people don't a lot of times understand the importance of the blood, and I think we do. Um, even in secular uh, history, because scientists and doctors turned away from God, they didn't understand the importance of blood. In fact, there used to be this surgical process to remove some of a patient's blood uh, for therapeutic purposes called what, y'all? Bloodletting. Many people died from bloodletting. They didn't have a clue what they were doing. They thought they were saving people by taking some of their blood out. Uh, they think George Washington may have even died from bloodletting. You know that. Now, later on, doctors realized that, no, the blood is hugely important. Don't take it out. Put more in. <laughs> Do a transfusion if necessary. Because they understood the importance of it. In fact, Leviticus 17, 11 tells us this. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. God gave them this as an understanding that it, life is in the blood, even all the way back. Listen, all the way back to where it began in Genesis. He says, we have redemption through his blood. Notice, not through his love, through his blood. It could have said, well, we have redemption through his love. We understand it's because of his love. It's because of his grace that we even are saved. We're saved by grace through faith. Amen, right? You know that. But it says through his blood because the blood was necessary. Yes, he loved us. Yes, his grace was there, but there was a requirement according to the law. In fact, we see the first religion in the Bible was when Adam and Eve covered themselves with the leaves. Y'all remember that? Trying to cover their sin and their shame. But then God, the Bible says, covered them. It says in Genesis 3.21, the Lord God made tunics of skin and covered them, which symbolizes the first death of an innocent animal to cover the sin of man. From the very beginning, God gave that picture. 
Adam began to understand this as Adam continued to, to do this as a sacrifice. And we, we, we kind of get the picture of that because in, in it also tells us by faith in Hebrews 11:4 on the screen, write this one down. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Remember, Abel brought uh, of the flock and Cain brought of the, of the vegetation of what he grew. And then it says, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, not because Abel was a good dude. I'm sure he was nice to hang out with, but because he understood something. God testifying of his gifts and through it, he being dead still speaks. Even Abel understood that there must be the sacrifice of blood because this is what God requires, an innocent sacrifice. It was a picture throughout the Old Testament. Hebrews 9 tells us this on the screen. Look at it with me. Hebrews 9 verses 21 through 23 says, then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels is what Aaron would sprinkle all this stuff of the ministry. And according to the law, notice, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. In other words, if there's no shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Therefore, notice it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. In other words, all of the things in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the utensils, it was all a copy of the heavenly scene, which I don't have time to develop. But the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. And this is the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hebrews goes on to tell us, chapter 9, verse 11 through 14 says it this way, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats or calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of the bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. In other words, if this symbolically did that in the Old Testament, how much more, verse 14 says, shall the blood of Christ, the perfect blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanses your conscience from dead works and to serve the living God. And I love this. In other words, it, notice it says here in our text again, in him we have this amazing redemption that I described for you earlier, but it's through his blood, a necessary payment. And think about it this way. Jesus' blood was so valuable that his blood has paid the price of sin itself. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, right? So his blood has made it possible for everyone in the, on the planet before, now, and after to be saved if they would only come. Jesus' blood has paid the price of sin, period, so that all those who would call upon him shall be saved. It's a beautiful thing, y'all. We just dealt with the book of Galatians and religion. It's a beautiful thing to understand that religion, you can't earn salvation. You can't be good enough to qualify for salvation. We know this, right? You can't do anything to make yourself saved. You can't do anything to make yourself more qualified for salvation than anybody else. We're all equally rotten, stinking sinners. <laughs> but Christ paid for all of that. And so when we come to him, we find redemption through his blood. There must have been the shedding of blood. And so Jesus offered his own blood as he bled out on the cross. And he acted as both high priest and sacrifice. And notice through his blood, notice it says the forgiveness of sins. I love this. The forgiveness of sins, meaning that when you come to Christ, your sin is forgiven. Now, this is, this is hard for a lot of people, especially that come out of religious settings, to deal with. We were in Columbia a few years ago, and one of the, the ladies on the missions team there was explaining to us the um, thought process of Catholicism in her country and in her city. There are a lot of beautiful historic Catholic churches throughout the city in Columbia, in Cali, Columbia. And she said to us, she said, the mentality is that you can do anything you want to do as long as you come and you confess and, and go to the priest and you, you pay and do all your things and then you're good again. So literally you can plan to have a wonderful time of sin and just make sure that you get there and, and take care of everything, you know? 
And she says, you don't have to change. Your life doesn't have to be any different today and tomorrow. You can send it up as long as you go and you go through the religious process. You follow me, right? A lot of religions offer you that. Christianity is not a religion. We understand that. Our salvation comes only through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And because of that, when we come to him in faith, believing he's the son of God to die for our sins and confessing our sins before him, he forgives us of our sins, which means that we are clean at that very moment. Whom the son sets free is free indeed. We don't even live with the, with the guilt of sin anymore. The Bible says that he casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. The Old Testament, Isaiah, God says that I'm he who desires to forget your sin, that I can have a relationship with you. This is what the whole process is. That's why God gave you free will, because he wants to have a relationship. He wants you to choose him. He's already chosen you, but he wants you to choose him. And he wants to cleanse you and forget about your sin and make you holy and acceptable before him in love, is what it's saying to us. So the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, and that's a beautiful phrase, the riches of his grace, because, you know, God's grace is abundant, ever giving, and it never runs out. Notice he says, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. In all of his wisdom and prudence, he made grace abound towards us because he knew we would need it. Amen. And his grace is multiplied. We talked about this last week. God's grace never gives out. His divine favor is what it means on our lives. Never gives out. Not only did he receive you through grace, he receives you through grace. And he's with you through grace daily. That's what scripture says. We don't have much time and I want to keep service short today. But we continue. Notice in verse 9 it says, having made known to us, and this is big, the mystery of his will. And we, we sometimes can lightly breeze through a verse like that and not pay a lot of attention to it. You have to understand that now that you are born again, that means you are alive to God by the Holy Spirit. He has made known, look what it says to you again, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, meaning that a mystery in the New Testament simply means something that was hidden has been revealed and made open. In other words, whereas we didn't understand his will for us, now that he has saved us, we literally are alive to him, and the very spirit of God that dwells in us is revealing to us through the scripture his will for our lives. If you want to know the will of God for your life, it's found in the very book that you're holding. The will of God for your life is in these scriptures. And it may be very different than what you think when you're caught up in the distractions of this world. And God is calling us to live a different life. And this is the thing that I preach over and over and over. And I will sound like a broken record until the trumpet blows. Because there are some important things that we don't want to let go of. When you look at the world and you think about how we used to live and, and how we live now in him and how it's very different. You know, the Bible calls us a peculiar people. Y'all ever read that? We are a very uh, peculiar people. You know that we're the kind of people that worship and praise him at a funeral, right? <laughs> Christians do weird things. You know, people can be bummed out about stuff that's going on and we have joy. It's contrary to the world. You follow me? Okay, so he, he has changed us and he has made us very peculiar and he desires that we live to glorify him. And in order to do that, we have to turn to him daily and not be bogged down or ensnared with the things of this life. Christians, listen, for us, we kind of like I always say, we're kind of cross-eyed, meaning that we, we are always living with one eye in the heavenlies and then the other one on earth. We have to be productive down here and stewards of the stuff. It's important that we be good stewards. It's important that we take care of the stuff. But our heart is in the heavenlies. Amen? Amen. And it's very important that we understand that. That's how he brings us through this. So he's made known to us the mysteries of his will. And if you would say in your heart now, don't say out loud, I don't feel like I know God's will. You are not in God's word enough. Because if you spend time with him, you meet him here, he will reveal his will for your life personally. Because life can be confusing. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times um, young people, especially young adults, they'll come up to me and they'll, they'll say stuff to me like, you know, well, well, Pastor Kevin, I got this situation going on. What do you think I should do? And, you know, I'm afraid of that question. Because I remember when I was young, and, you know, some of the decisions I didn't have any guidance on, you know, I wish I had had a little bit more guidance. You ever felt like that? 
And I don't know which, I mean, I wish I had gone a different way than I did. And I'm afraid for that question because I know now being, you know, 20 something years in the future, I know that what I say to them could affect and impact their lives very seriously. And so I take them to prayer very quickly and to the word because it's very, very, the thing, the very thing that people want to know is which way should I go? What should I do? Maybe somebody here this morning is trying to figure out what should I do? <laughs> which way should I go? Well, he's made known to us the mystery of his will for our lives if we would just simply meet him on the pages of his scripture and say, Lord, show me your way. Lord, speak to me. <coughs> Lead me and guide my life. And then you wait for the peace of God that passes all understanding to do just that in your life. He is speaking to us on the, through the pages of his scripture. Notice he says, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. God purposed all of this in himself. It's so wonderful to listen to this language that he purposed it in himself. That he made it abound towards us, verse 8, in all wisdom and prudence. It all speaks of the fact that God planned all things out for us before he began. He's got it all taken care of. I love when I travel and, and I'm fussing up my wife because she's the last one out the house. Then we get wherever we're going and she's packed all this stuff that we need. And I'm just saying, I'm so glad you, you didn't forget that, you know. But, but, but listen, God in eternity's past did that for us. This is what... He's done as a wonderful father and a good God that he's played, laid the whole thing out for us, and we need to go to him for guidance. Verse, verse uh, 10, as we kind of come to an end here for today, that in the dispensation, notice, of the fullness of the times, he might gather together, I love this, in one, all things, notice again, in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Notice again, in him. See, spiritually, we are positioned right now in Christ. That means Christ literally carries us in him, in, in his heart even. But one day, in the fullness of the dispensation of the fullness of time, he's going to gather all things together. And this is what we're waiting for, y'all. This is what we're living for. He's going to gather all things, both, notice what it says, all things in Christ. We're going to be gathered in him, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. It's a beautiful verse because it reminds us of the fact that he's already promised that I'm going away, uh, John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place. Y'all know those verses. I will come again and receive you that you may be where I am, literally for all eternity. So the Lord is preparing to come get the rest of his bride. I say the rest because part of the bride's already there. Those who are in heaven with him, those who have already passed on. Because as believers, we have life eternal. We don't, we don't die. We understand that. Our bodies end because our bodies are falling in nature. And until we're resurrected, this thing will deteriorate and we will lay it down. But we, being absent from this, will be present with him. Scripture tells us that, right? We understand that. But there's a day coming that Paul is talking about here where he's going to gather all things. We, he talks about it in Thessalonians. A trumpet will blast. The Lord will descend himself. He's not going to send a delegate. He's coming himself. He's going to descend with the shout and the voice of the, the archangel. He will meet the church in the clouds. He will bring the souls of those who have already passed away with him. Go back and read it carefully. Then the dead in Christ will rise first. Not a contradiction. It's the resurrection as their bodies will be resurrected with their souls. They will be resurrected beings. Then those who are alive at the time will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then we'll be forever with the Lord. He's going to do a, what I call a great gathering. I love family reunions, but the biggest family reunion is yet to come. And this one will be amazing. We'll all be gathered. And the beautiful thing is we don't always get along down here. We don't even like each other sometimes. And all, don't, don't laugh too much. Don't laugh too much. Because I know, anyway, some of y'all. Um, we're learning to, though. But he's going to gather all things in Christ, in the heavenlies, in the air, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, and we will be together. Notice it says, I got I to gotta try to wrap this up. I want to do verse 11 next week because I want to spend some time in it. But notice in him we also have obtained an inheritance. Being, here's our word again, prede predestined or predetermined according to the purpose of his will, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so we'll stop there. We'll pick it up next week.
But God is so good. And I want you to leave here today continuing to praise him, understanding that even though we go through things down here, these are temporary things. We're moving through, passing through, visiting. Have a light touch on the world. Don't get too wrapped up in it. Because the thing is, Jesus says that he's, his coming is not something that's going to be evident to many. Many will be living in the last days when the Lord returns as though he's not coming. Many are going to mock and say, well, where is this coming? Y'all Christians always talk about the Lord coming, but look at all the stuff that's going on. Where is he at? So many will mock and scoff. But the Bible tells us that he will come and to many will be like a thief in the night because they're not looking for him. But the spirit of God that's in you has made it so that you are looking from him. You may not fully understand it, but you're longing for something that you can't find on earth. That's why we gather together to worship together to encourage one another, to feast on his word so that we can be strengthened and continue to press through. But we're longing for something that we cannot get on this earth. I don't care how spiritual you are. This earth won't satisfy you. It's the spiritual blessings you have that satisfy you. And what we're waiting for is to be face to face with our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so while we're here, we're going to worship him. We're going to glorify him. But we desire to see him face to face. Let's pray. Bow your heads. Father, we do thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be here, that you have put a joy in us in the midst of trials that is so wonderful, Lord God. It's the evidence that we belong to you. And I pray that you would continue to move in our hearts, Lord God, that you would continue to strengthen us and encourage us, Lord God. Be with us and give us, Lord, direction as we minister to those who are in need in our state. Uh, Lord, let us go only where you send us and let us do the things that you've called us to do. And we pray that in that process, you will be glorified. And if any, if there you head bowed, every eye closed, if there's anyone in the room that does not know Jesus personally and would love to know him today, that would like to receive the redemption of the soul, the forgiveness of sin. And if you raise your hand right where you are with every head bowed and every eye closed, that I may see and pray with you. Today is a good day for salvation because we're alive and the Lord loves us. So if you want to come to him today, just put your hand up right where you are. Lord, we love you. We thank you for meeting us here. I pray that you would go with each person as they leave this place, each family. Be with them in their cars, in their homes, those who are going to work, Lord God, those who are traveling uh, this week back down to the coast. Lord, be with them. Lord, whatever they find there, let them be filled with your joy nevertheless. And let them praise you for life. And we, uh, we thank you for them, those that were with us here today from the coast. Lord, we thank you for them. Lord, we love you and we thank you corporately now in Jesus' name. Let's say it together, saints. Amen. 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 Let's stand. Let's sing.